So we're going to start today by looking at the functional anatomy of the GI system. We'll talk about the different structures which constitute the GI, from the mouth to the anus, and then we'll talk a little bit about the layers of the GI and some function. Okay. So the first objective is to identify the various tissue layers and the organs that make up the gastrointestinal system. Now, typically our bodies, our cells need to be nourished, they need oxygen, they need ATP, they need um, the nutrients from food we eat, those, those major biochemical um, molecules such as carbs, proteins, and fats, those things need to get into our cells, right? But they're too large to go into the blood directly. That's where the GI system comes into play. Those molecules need to be digested and absorbed. Right? Digestion means breaking food into small pieces to aid in absorption, which is the movement of those nutrients across the epithelial layer. Two other processes that are involved in the GI system which aid in digestion and absorption are motility and secretion. So motility is the movement of these substances through the GI tract. Okay, we'll talk about how that's brought about. And then secretion is basically mucus being released into the GI tract to aid in that motility, right? The more slippery things are, the more moist, the more um, masticated, I'll say, um, or broken down and lubricated the GI tract is, the easier these substances can move through the GI and then be absorbed across the epithelial layer. All right, so the divisions of the GI system are basically the gastrointestinal tract, First of all, it's one continuous hollow tube. So from your mouth, which starts at the oral orifice, to your anus, which ends at the <coughs> anal orifice, is a hollow tube that's continuous, about 15 feet long, and there are different parts of that tube that have different functions. So we know the mouth has the teeth that are responsible for chewing, masticating that food, lubricating it, starting the digestive process. The pharynx is a conduit, basically, that's transporting those that, um, digested that food down into the stomach. The stomach is a storage tank. It's basically mulching that, that food together, adding acid to help break down other components of that food. And then from the stomach, we start moving through the small intestines, then the large intestines, or the colon. And finally, we get to the rectum and the uterus. Also, a component of the GI system are some accessory glands, to the salivary glands. We look at the salivary glands. They release their secretions into the oral cavity. And from there, they can begin to break down that food. They can begin to lubricate that food and turn it into a substance called chyme. So by the time this food reaches in the stomach, it's no longer noticeable food or food particles, but it's this liquidy, semi-solid <coughs> um, material that's called chyme. And we'll talk about that as we move on. So the glands help to release their secretions. Other glands we'll talk about are the pancreas, which is a gland. The liver is also a gland, the largest in the body. And those secretions help in this digestive process. All right, let's look at the layers of the gastrointestinal system. <coughs> let's look at the layers of the GI system. So when we look at the layers of the GI tract, there are three major layers from lumen to the exterior surface. So let's pretend we take a part of any part of the GI system from the mouth, from the esophagus down to the, the uh, anus, and we took a cross section of that part of the tube. Right, let's say we look at the esophagus, for example, and we took a cross section, meaning a plane that's running right across the esophagus. All right, this is our lumen, so this is the inside of that tube. And then this is gonna be the exterior surface, the outer surface. 
So we'll look at the layers from lumen to the outer surface of the GI tract. Now, the first layer is going to be the mucosa, but the mucosa has three sublayers, right? Three parts to it. So the very first part is going to be the epithelial layer. We talked extensively about epithelia, right? What is epithelia? Where is it found? What does it do? What is epithelial tissue? So it's not the, it's the innermost layer, right? closest to the lumen. And it's that layer to cell next to cell next to cell. Do you guys remember that epithelial layer we talked about last semester? One cell next to the other next to the other. There were different shapes and different types. This is what the first layer is, the epithelial layer. Okay, the epithelial layer. Now this epithelial layer will be of different types of cells at different parts of the GI. So in the esophagus, it's gonna be stratified squamous epithelium. In the stomach, it's gonna be simple columnar epithelium. But just know that the first layer from the lumen is gonna be an epithelial layer, which is basically a bunch of cells. The second layer from that is going to be the lamina propria. Okay, let's draw this here. So the lamina propria is sort of the connective tissue layer of the epithelia. Remember we said the epithelia is a vascular, so it doesn't get its own blood supply, it doesn't get its own nerves and its own um, veins. It has to get those from the underlying connective tissue. So the lamina propria has blood vessels. <coughs> it has, you know, nerves, <coughs> sorry, arteries, veins, The second layer is the lamina propria. Let's see that, sorry. So lamina, I'll write it with a smaller, so we can see the spot, lamina propria, okay? The third layer from that is gonna be the outermost layer of muscle. Now, what type of muscle are we talking about in the GI? Smooth muscle, right? So this is a first layer of muscle, and this is a very thin layer of muscle. This is called the muscularis mucosa, and that basically means the muscle of the mucosa, okay? The muscle of the mucosa. Again, smooth muscle, a very thin layer, and this actually has two different directions to the fibers. We'll talk about that but basically the muscularis mucosa is the third layer of the mucosa, all right? So these three layers together are the mucosa or the mucosal layer. Okay. The second layer we'll talk about is called the submucosa. Right, so right outside of the, the uh, mucosa, which ends at the muscularis mucosa, is the submucosa. So it's a bit of a thicker layer, right? It has bigger nerves, bigger blood vessels, like right? the ones of the lamina propria are very tiny. Their job was basically to feed just the epithelial layer. Remember, the epithelia is a vascular. So the nerves and blood vessels that feed the epithelial layer come from the lamina propria. Whereas the other parts of the structure are fed by the bigger vessels, bigger nerves, bigger arteries that are found in the submucosa. All right, got some arteries here. These bigger arteries. We also have some nerves, and I'll sort of draw these in yellow. This is the submucosa. And there's a very important plexus in this layer. I'm going to label it here. It's called the submucosal plexus. It's also called the Meissner's plexus. Okay. 
Okay, that's a component of the autonomic nervous system or the myoenteric nervous system, which basically is how the GI is innervated. Okay, so we had the mucosa, and then right outside of the mucosa is the submucosa, which has bigger nerves, bigger arteries, bigger vessels, and the submucosal plexus or the mycinous plexus. Now, outside of the submucosa, we have a thicker layer. This is called the muscularis externa. So this is a much thicker layer of muscle. And again, if you see the word muscularis, we know we're dealing with muscle. So the muscularis, on this side, and I'm writing this in red because it's a muscle, the muscularis externa, is the thick, meaty, sort of the specialized part of the GI tract. This is the area of the GI that's gonna be responsible for the movement, the motility, right? As that smooth muscle contracts, it's gonna move food all through the GI tract. And this is the thickest part of the, 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 the layers of the tract, right? There's also another plexus here in the muscularis externa. It's called the Arbax plexus. Right? And this is similar to the Meissner's plexus, right? They're both a part of the enteric system. So the autonomic nervous system, which innervates the GI, okay? And then the final outer layer is a connective tissue layer. It's basically a protective layer. It's much thinner in some areas. And this is called a serosa. Right, the serosa. So the serosa is just the connective tissue layer. Okay. So basically from lumen to the outer surface, we have two layers of muscle, right? That first layer of muscle is gonna be the muscularis mucosa, <laughs> which is the part of the mucosa. It's a part of that first inner layer. The second layer of muscle is gonna be the muscularis externa, which is this real thick part of the GI tract, this outer, um, thick part of the wall. And then the final layer is going to be the civil south side. All right, any questions on this? Okay. So let's continue to move on here and we'll talk about this um, as we continue. All right, so just recapping that information, right? The wall of the, the GI tract has the mucosa, the inner lining, right, closest to the lumen, the submucosa, which is the connective tissue lining outside of that, the muscularis external, which is that thick layer of smooth muscle, and the connective tissue layer, which is the serosa. Okay. Let's look more closely at the layers of the mucosa. We said that it helps to separate the GI lumen from the internal environment. In areas like the stomach, that's going to be very important, right? The stomach has a very acid, highly acid, acidic content. And so it's very important to have a layer of cells that are protecting the underlying tissues from being exposed to that acid, right? Um, we also have different types of cells at different areas throughout the GI tract within this layer. There are absorptive, absorptive cells. There are exocrine cells, so the garlic cells, or the mucus. They're endocrine cells, which is the APUD cells, which we'll talk about. They're part of the neuroendocrine system. All right, so they're different cells that have different functions at different parts throughout the GI tract. All right, the three layers of the mucosa, as we just described, are going to be the epithelial layer, which is the cells that are right at the lumen, the lamina propria, which is the connective tissue layer. Again, in the lamina propria, we're going to see small blood vessels small nerves that are just feeding the epithelia. And then finally, the thin layer of smooth muscle, which is the muscularis mucosa. And again, if you look at that word muscularis mucosa, it's the muscle of the mucosa layer. <coughs> the other layer is gonna be the, if we look more closely at the lamina propria, as I just mentioned, we have those small blood vessels, small nerves, lymphatic tissue. But we also have some of the lymph aggregates, such as the lymphatic nodules and the Peyer's patch. The Peyer's patch is the name of the lymphatic aggregates that are found in the intestines. 
Okay, so these are all found within the lamina propria layer. And again, the lamina propria is a part of the mucosa. Um, the second layer out, again, is the muscularis mucosa. I'm sorry, the last layer of the epithelial mucosa here is the muscularis mucosa. This is a thin layer of smooth muscle. There are two directions to the fibers in this layer. There are longitudinal fibers and circular fibers. When I say longitudinal and circular, I mean that some of the fibers are running around the lumen in a circular pattern, and some of the fibers are running up and down the length of the lumen in a longitudinal pattern. And what this creates is both uh, horizontal contractions as well as longitudinal contractions. And so you have that allowing the mixing and mulching of different parts of the GI. So you have squeezing in a circular fashion and squeezing in a longitudinal fashion. So this helps to mix the contents very nicely within the lumen. All right, the second layer out is the submucosa, a thicker layer of connective tissue, much thicker than the lamina propria, but it's comparable to the lamina propria. We have larger blood vessels here, larger lymphatic vessels here, and we have the Meissner's plexus, also called submucosal plexus, which is a part of the autonomic or enteric nervous system. All right, the function of the submucosa is for elasticity, to help distend that <coughs> GI tract, to allow large volumes of food and liquid, as well as elasticity, to allow that to stretch, right, to stretch and then to bounce back to its original shape. Okay. The muscular layer, or the meaty layer, as I like to call it, is the muscularis externa, which basically means the external muscle. This has two layers, again, two directional fibers, the inner circular layer, which changes the diameter of the tube, right, going in and out in a circular fashion, and then the longitudinal layer, which changes the length of the tube, going up and down in a longitudinal fashion. The part of the nervous system that is found here is called the myenteric plexus or the arbax plexus, and this is also part of the autonomic nervous system. So, we want to distinguish these two parts of the nervous system. One is found in the submucosa, right? That's the Meissner's plexus, whereas the myenteric plexus or the Arbax plexus is found in the muscularis externa, so that thick, smooth muscle layer, right? And the final layer, the outer connective tissue layer, which was the serosa, in some areas of the GI tract, this is continuous with the mesothelia, right? We talked about the mesothelia. This so becomes the peritoneum, right? The peritoneum, which is that, thing, that single layer of cells and that serous fluid that's being secreted to help lubricate the outer parts of the, of the components. All right, so the serosa, which is also called the um, mesothelium, is continuous with the peritoneum. All right, so let's move on to the functional anatomy. Let's talk about some function as we talk about each of these structures. The mouth, this helps to masticate, to chew the food, there's secretion of saliva. Saliva helps to, one, start the breakdown process. We have saliva the amylase, which begins the digestion of starch in the mouth. We also have mucus, right? Mucus, which is help to, helping to lubricate and masticate the food to make this a very slippery um, semi-solid substance. So saliva is doing two things. It's lubricating and it's beginning the breakdown process. Then we move into the pharynx. And remember I said the pharynx is basically just a conduit, just a pipe, just a passageway to allow the food to go from the mouth to the stomach. So the pharynx, which is that common opening, right? The pharynx is the opening to both the throat. I'm sorry, the pharynx, which is the, is the opening to both the lungs and the esophagus, is that common passageway for food and air. Right, when we talk about food specifically, the pharynx becomes continuous with the esophagus. <coughs> Moving down to the esophagus, so this is a muscular tube that moves food from the pharynx down to the stomach. The upper third of this is skeletal. Skeletal meaning that you have voluntary control. This is why you can bring back up food to a certain degree, like the upper one third of your esophagus, you can control those muscles. You can try to bring um, or try to control the reflex up to that point. Beyond that point, the lower two thirds, right, and the middle third is mixed, but the lower two thirds, we have that transition where it becomes smooth muscle. And we no longer have voluntary control over the esophagus beyond that point. 
There are some sphincters that control the movement of food through the esophagus, the upper esophageal sphincter. Again, this is skeletal muscle because you have control over it. And this is regarding to the, the swallowing process. So it is that ability of voluntary control at the, the upper esophageal sphincter. This is between the pharynx and the esophagus. Right? You can decide whether or not you want to swallow something. You can choose to swallow it. All right? The lower esophageal sphincter, we don't have control. This is smooth muscle. This is between the esophagus and the stomach. This is where the esophagus ends. And here, we don't have any control. Food will move from the esophagus into the stomach based upon the sensibility of the esophagus, based upon how full or empty the stomach is. 